Uh, my name's Josh. I was with Tufer, and now I'm thrilled to be at Salesforce, two thumbs way up. Uh, three thumbs way up. Uh, product management at Salesforce is awesome. So what I'd like to talk about today is the myths of, authentic the myths of authentication. Say that three times fast. Well, I say everything fast, so I guess that's what it is. Um, like any good summer feature, I will try and include a dwarf, a dinosaur, and Darth Vader into this as well. So let's go ahead and start at the beginning. Identity. Authentication. Identity and authentication is never talking about these things as a consolidated thing, but I think we're starting to blur those lines where we can actually use one for the other so that we don't have to worry about this as much. So what are the myths we want to talk about today? So abbreviated in a fun way, uh, strong but squishy learning is a wishy and I can't even read that, but idiosyncratic risk of a user is a tolerable consequence of misallocated market dynamics, otherwise known as risk is delishy. And the problem is if we subscribe to all of these myths, we're led to something that is fishy. Okay, so we want to break these down one at a time, talk about them, and then actually get to a model by which we can deconstruct and mitigate specific aspects of risk of a user. So first, myth one. It's kind of a small but powerful thing. Strong but squishy. What do we mean? We're focusing on the outside so much, we're not really worried about the fundamentally disappointing part of the inside of it, right? Like a Tootsie Roll pop. So does everybody remember Mike Tyson? And maybe not this version of Mike Tyson, which coincidentally is maybe the worst advertisement for Dove chocolate ever, uh, but the old Mike Tyson, right? The Mike Tyson that, for those of us who grew up in the 80s, this is what we remember, right? So arguably strong on the outside, a little squishy on the inside. But this is, <laughs> this is not how I remember Mike Tyson. I remember in all of his 8-bit glory as Mike Tyson from Mike Tyson's Punch-Out, right? Also known as the last time anybody under 45 gave two shits about boxing. So here's the thing about Mike Tyson's Punch-Out. You've got Don Flamenco to an eight-year-old, pretty challenging foe. You punch him a couple times, he knocks you down. You got King Hippo, he's three times bigger than you are as Little Mac, and guess what? He knocks you down. You got Bald Bull, these become comically large, right? He's four times bigger than you are, and what happens? You knock him down. Externally difficult. It's a strong external barrier. But fast. So strong but squishy. This is where we are in authentication today, right? We're focusing all of our time on the outside. We build our security fence and we do this by putting in passwords and then make it stronger with tokens and mobile devices and biometrics. And great, this is wonderful. It doesn't matter really if you're in band or out of band authentication. You have the ability to really worry about the fact that there's a fundamental disconnect here because you worry about so much on the outside, you forget that all of your stuff's on the inside. Right? Not just your stuff, but also my stuff. And the problem with your stuff being on the inside is that it's of no use to you if you can't get to it. So what do we do? The stuff tries desperately to get out, and the only way you can actually unlock the door is by relying on somebody like this. And this is a problem, because the user is squish. Right? It's the risk involved here. This is a strong, again, but powerful point, just like our dwarfish friend here. Let's uh, change the analogy for a second. Right? Think about the Great Wall. Uh, greater. Uh, dark turn. There we go, great wall. So you've got this great wall, and it's this wonderful feat, right? It's a modern world wonder that we constructed this thing. But the fact of the matter is we're still relying on the squish, right? There's still guards that have to maintain the access to and from. And so whether they're relatively negligent or complicit in letting people through, that was pixelated, the fact of the matter is you still have your user being your squish. The user is the risk. So I know we're talking a lot about risk here and as we have throughout several presentations, and we're really gonna dive a lot deeper so we can actually have a fundamental appreciation for what risk is and how we can mitigate it. Uh, but what, do we, what does risk look like today to a provider and to a user? Okay, so let's talk about it in today's model, or probably more of like the 1987 Ford Tempo model of uh, identity management when it comes to security. It's the fact that we've got provider is, is assuming two different types of risk. It's assuming its own specific provider risk, and it's also bringing on its common user risk. And so what does this look like? You've got your provider, and you make that gate stronger and stronger and thicker and thicker, and it's wonderful until you realize this is kind of an old way of doing it, right? That's the dinosaur, because you're really just focusing on that external perspective. You're not worried about the user. But the fact is you've got this user, right? And this user, specifically, interacts with you, right? But the problem with this user is that he may or may not point that dirty arrow in multiple directions and interact with a whole lot of other providers too, turning him into this relatively, let's say, promiscuous user, right? And if you've got this type of promiscuity, you have this introduction of specific user risk that you would want to mitigate, and we do in different industries. So let's think about it 
from the standpoint of maybe a financial portfolio for a second, but if you've got all these different arrows, you've got all these different relationships, maybe the user is in fact a portfolio of identities, okay? So if it's a portfolio of identities, maybe there's something we can use from a cross-disciplinary approach to essentially say, look, maybe we can avoid phishing because if the user is the squish, then it doesn't really matter how many arbitrary layers of abstraction we put on top of them. If the user is going to willingly or unwillingly open the door for a bad actor, that becomes unnecessary risk that we're taking, right? And this becomes even tougher because we have this relatively unfair incentive structure in place when it comes to security today as well. So let's imagine a world in where Americans even know what this is, right? And so for, for those of you who don't understand what soccer is, there are three different types of players in soccer. There are the offensive players, there are the defensive players, and the fundamentally offensive players. Okay, so when it comes to the attackers, the incentive structure is this. Kick it as many times as you possibly can to score. And if you win, you get to take off your clothes, run naked around a stadium, and laud it as a hero. And if you miss, so what, try again. Or you can be a goalie, i.e. a security professional, which is to throw your face in front of every oncoming ball into the goal, and if you succeed, great, that's what we pay you to do. And if you fail, you're out of a job, right? That doesn't seem quite as fun as being the attacker. So this actually works out as a nice kind of endpoint on myth one, because FIFA itself is probably very strong on the outside, but also very squishy on the inside. So myth one, let's go to myth two. Myth two, learning is a wishy. What do we mean here? We mean that education alone cannot mitigate idiosyncratic user risk. And idiosyncratic is a big fancy word, we'll get to that in a second. But the fact of the matter is, does this actually work? Can we educate people enough to avoid making the same mistakes over and over and over again? I'm gonna say no. Um, and I'm gonna say no from the standpoint of not just this specific example, but other examples, right? It's important. I do not wanna take away from the ability to stress that education is a vital part of this, but we cannot rely on it alone is the only thing that we're going to use in order to mitigate the user risk, right? So let's, let's prove it, and as you guys can demonstrate, uh, have, hopefully have already demonstrated right now, uh, I have a very large tolerance for awkward moments. This is the interactive portion of it, so I will just wait for you guys to react. So quick show of hands, who here has never, ever been fished? Okay, one person. So maybe a lot of shy people, but this is good. Um, this is good. Um, so who, this is an interesting question, who here has fished somebody else because we know how good and effective it is? That's a lot more hands. That's slightly alarming, but also good. Um, okay, and then who here, this is one of my favorites, who believes they are completely and impenetrably unfishable? Well, that's good. Um, uh, one hand in the back, just keep your hand up for a second so I can write your name down, that's, that's fun. Okay, good. Um, so look, the fact of the matter is even the best of us can be distracted, and hypervigilance, it's, it's great, but it's not a practical, ongoing, continuous assumption that we can actually reinforce. So education, it's, it's good, but, but so what? what? What if we do nothing else, right? So this kind of becomes myth three, which is this idea of risk is delicious, we love risk, right? Well, this is the default scenario we live in today, right? Because if we do nothing, then the status quo is gonna continue onward. So are we satisfied with this attack vector? And to be clear, I'm not saying that necessarily a set of fish credentials is a full breach. But I would say that most full breaches are going to start with an entry point, right? So how can we fix this? And like my presentation last year, everything usually hinges around this thing of changing perspective. Let's look at the world slightly differently for a moment. Um, as hearkened in the first principle, um, a person perhaps is not just a single identity, right? It's not just that one arrow. A person, in fact, is a portfolio of identities. And if this is something that we can put on pause for a second and talk in a completely different way, just out of curiosity, do I have any of my hedge fund managers and or prop desk traders in the audience today? Sweet, so this is gonna be new for a little bit of you. Um, so this is the first four minutes of my financial 377.2 class that I teach. Uh, and so I guess as a good uh, non sequitur, my portfolio of identities. I am at Salesforce, the director of portfolio management, uh, product management. Um, I also have lots of Google email addresses. Uh, I also happen to be an adjunct professor of financial management at the McComb School of Business at the University of Texas at Austin. So I'm now going to let my worlds collide and discuss an interdisciplinary approach into risk management as it applies to finance and how it can be interpolated to identity risk. So, three stocks walk into a bar. 
Okay, uh, and those three stocks, just for um, the, the purpose of this demonstration, are going to be Merck, IBM, and InBev. And each one of these presents its own specific risk into a portfolio, right? So for example, IBM's risk could be that, I don't know, Microsoft comes out with Sherlock, or uh, Merck that an FDA does not approve its next drug, or Bud that people in this country wake up and realize what beer's actually supposed to taste like. So if you've, that was the most tame of the ones I had come up with, so that's good. Uh, so, but if you plot them on a risk return axis, there are some stocks that are gonna give you more return, you're taking more risk. Some stocks will give you less return, you're taking less risk, right? And there's this idea of portfolio management that if you blend them all together, in this case, we'll just say they're equally weighted into a portfolio, you can create a portfolio that gives you good return and less risk. And on a risk return basis, much better return for the risk you're taking. So, let's see if we can apply this into an identity structure. So, if we talk about H, uh, Harry Markowitz, or H Mark, for those of you in the know, he created this thing called the Efficient Frontier, which says this, essentially there's a capital market line of all of the consolidated portfolios available in the market, and if you start blending individual assets together, you can move up and to the left. And I know lots of us are Gartner fans, so it's up and to the left this time, not up and to the right. Up and to the left is where we want to go, right? More return, less risk. And so if we do this, well, it's a good point. Let's back up for a second and do a couple more basics, right? You've got return, which is mu. You've got sigma, which is your risk. And if you plot them on a normal Gaussian coordinate system, you've got this, right? The, the return is the thing you want, right? It's this, wow, I got what I was looking for. And the neat thing about return is that you can stack them on top of each other, right? So from a really simplistic standpoint, the equal weighted distribution within a portfolio of the individual uh, returns can be con collapsed into essentially the portfolio return, right? It's just the equal average of all of them divided and put it together again. <sighs> risk is a little different, right? Risk is not the thing you want, it's the, ooh, maybe not the gift I quite wanted, right? And so the thing about risk, unfortunately, is risk does not stack. Risk takes into consideration not only the individual contri contribution of individual assets, but also the combination of the assets as well. And so this last part over here where you've got rho sigma sigma, this is your idiosyncratic risk. This can be mitigated in portfolio management. But today in identity, we just take and eat the entire thing. So. Where were we? Yes, efficient frontiers, right. So you've got this thing where you've got all of your individual contributors. If you put them together, you can hit the market portfolio. You're going to take less risk and you're going to get a better return. And so if you look at this corporate line, for, uh, this capital market line here, you're taking less return and lower risk with your treasury bills. In small stocks, you would take more return, higher risk. But if you break these out and you look at the S&P 500 in an individual contribution perspective, notice that virtually every individual asset underperforms the capital market line. So how is an identity industry, can we move to the capital market line? How how can we reduce our risk without changing user experience? Okay, so let's talk about risk for a second when we really focus in on it, right? Two types of risk. You've got specific risk and you've got common risk. So what is specific risk? Specific risk is idiosyncratic. It's specific to the individual asset. So think about your home. Oh, sorry, your home, there you go. And so the thing about your home is that it could catch on fire, right? That sucks, but it doesn't affect an entire city. The entire state doesn't go up in fire, right? It's just your house. It's idiosyncratic. Or think about like if your house is burgled, which is also coincidentally the noise you make after drinking a Bud Light, burgled. So if your house is burgled, it's your house that's burgled, not the entire city that's burgled, right? That's, idios that's idiosyncratic risk. So common risk or systemic risk, though, is risk that affects everything, right? So I'm from Austin. So right now, right? we're all underwater. It's a flood. It affects the entire city. Right? Or if you've got an earthquake, that affects an entire city. That does not just affect your house specifically. And these are the things that, I just crashed PowerPoint. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Give me a second. Yeah. I can do it like Ian and just do the entire thing from memory at this point. Oh. That's a complete falsehood. Okay, everything's opening up. Just give me just a second here. Everybody buying it so far? Always, Always. okay. Uh, all right, so this is your house. This is your house on fire. This is common systemic risk. All right, earthquakes, cool. So specific risk within a portfolio can be diversified, right? And so now we're taking that same equation for risk, and we're adding one more variable to it, and you notice that you add one more individual contributant, uh, but you also get now two new idiosyncratic risk coefficients in here, which means that the more assets you add to this, the more identities you add to your identity portfolio, the more risk you can actually mitigate, right? And so if you look at this, this is really important. What this says essentially is that for every 
identity you're adding, for every asset you're adding to a financial portfolio, you can actually mitigate the specific risk component of the portfolio and get to a market risk portfolio, whereas essentially after 10 identities or 10 assets in a portfolio, your portfolio is really just taking market risk. And market risk is okay because everybody takes market risk. And market risk is okay because it's really hard to hack market risk. So identity has both user-specific and common risks, but today we're taking both of them from the user's perspective, and that's not acceptable. So by making a user portfolio, we can mitigate this portion. So let's think about it from a current perspective, right? Right now we rely on our own proprietary identities, right? It's this, that I give Ian a user, Ian uses this, I, I give Ian an identity, I, Ian uses his identity uh, for my provider, right? But I, as a provider, can't make a portfolio of a specific asset. That's like a hedge fund manager coming to you and charging you two and 20 for a portfolio for Merck, right? That, that's just an asset, that's not a portfolio. But, and if we only take this one asset, we have to eat all of that specific risk. That, that, that user goes and does all these different things with their credentials. This is the Matt Honan risk, right? But if the user is a portfolio, we can diversify this risk. So the potential model here is that we use a portfolio identity and so that we can take all of these interactions together. So what does this look like? Now, I'm gonna pretend to be on the dark side just for a second here to bring this uh, all the way back with finance and identity. But essentially, this is the efficient frontier. This is what we've talked about for the last, probably too long in your opinion. But here's what we do. Let's get rid of IBM and talk about that's your corporate identity. Let's get rid of this and talk about that's your personal communication, your email identity. Maybe you've got your social identity as well. And we blend these assets together and we can create an identity portfolio. Now, let's do an example of this, right? Like, let's get really in the weeds. We need to talk about three concepts real fast, right? The first is identity return. The next is identity risk. And then we need to talk about identity correlation. So. What is identity return? Identity return is gonna be the value in trusting that identity. And we'll arbitrarily assign it a score of zero to one for this purpose, right? And so what is identity risk? Well, in, in adhering with the specific example that we're talking about finance right now, it's the volatility of the value of trusting that identity, right? Which means that the higher the value, the higher the return, the higher the risk you could potentially take with that identity. Zero to one risk as well. What's breach correlation? Well, let's talk about what correlation is to begin with, right? If Merck goes up and Bud goes up, then it's a correlation of one. If Merck goes up and Bud does whatever it ever does, it has no relationship, it's got a, it's got a row coefficient of zero. And if Merck goes up and every time that happens, Bud goes down, it's a negative correlation. So if we talk about this in this construct, then the identity correlation is approximating the joint mistrust. If one's taken over, then the other is likely taken over as well. So if we talk about this arbitrarily, again, our corporate ID risk is gonna be 0.75, our email risk will be 0.5, and our social ID risk will be 0.3, and we have a correlation table here that essentially says, look, maybe my corporate credential is relatively unique, but let's call a spade a spade, right? My personal email is also how I log into Facebook. Okay, so that's a 0.9. So if we take this equation and we just substitute these numbers back in, we're given a total portfolio risk of 0.4438. Now, how does this spec out on the spectrum? Corporate risk, 0.75, email risk, 0.5, social risk, 0.3, total portfolio risk, 0.4438. All we did was we blended these identities together and we've already mitigated a huge amount of risk in the portfolio, arguably maybe even half of it, right? So we get rid of a lot of idiosyncratic risk. But that's just carte blanche. That's not even doing anything better than what we might be doing today, right? So let's assume we're adding a little bit of corporate multi-factor authentication and some decent monitoring into the system as well. Keep the corporate risk the same, keep the social risk the same, keep the email risk the same. Let's change the correlations because now we're making the corporate identity a little bit more unique and harder to hack because you've got multi-factor authentication and some monitoring going on. We'll leave the email and social relationship the same at 0.9. And here's what you plug in you get a total risk perspective of 0.2774. How does this spec on the spectrum? Look at that, right? Now I know these are arbitrary numbers, but the fact of the matter is what this allows us to do is take multiple identities, blend them together as a portfolio, and mitigate the idiosyncratic portion of the user risk, which is good for all of us. So how do we conclude? What do we learn in the last 266 slides? Well, number one, we need to eliminate more risk. And why do we need to do this? Well, just Let's talk to our brethren, right? Other industries don't take this risk. In other industries, if you take too much risk, they throw your asses on the street, right? And we don't need to be these companies, right? And so here's the thing though, as somebody in the financial world, if you wanna to continue to take those other sides of that risk, I'm more than happy to take the other side in some way, okay? <laughs> because this is the inevitability of it, right? <sighs> Do not be the Tootsie Roll Pop. Do not focus on the outside, ignore the inside. Do not be the one who's throwing their face arbitrarily in front of oncoming traffic. Do not eat the bird, okay? So, if we wanna mitigate this risk, here's what it could potentially look like. And this is relatively thematic through what you've heard for the last couple of days, right? If you wanna eliminate phishing, if your corporate ID gets phished, 
and it's tied to some sort of relationship of a portfolio of identities that allows it to anchor, whether through shared signals or other types of mitigating consequences, then essentially that corporate ID is no longer as easily fishable as it was, if not not fishable from the idiosyncratic risk perspective. Now, we're gonna make two critical assumptions here. First, that the user is a willing participant in this, Right? You have to have buy-in from the user community. But so far, I think that's gonna be relatively easy. Not from the standpoint of getting them to do it, but the fact is this is something that doesn't affect their user experience and it gives them more, more return and better security. Okay, the second is that we have, to, we have to collaborate as an industry, right? Providers have to get on board and say that, yeah, there's something we can do together to interact with each other. And in so doing, we can actually create this network effect that allows us to mitigate uh, idiosyncratic risks through the work of portfolio identities. So, in summary, we've got three myths, right? They revolve around a dwarf, a dinosaur, and Darth Vader. And they are strong but squishy, learning is a wishy, risk is delishy, and if you can mitigate these things, you don't have to worry about leading to fishy anymore. So, identity risk is a composite of two different types of risk, both user-specific risk and user-common uh, risk. And if we treat a user as a, a person, as a portfolio of identities, then and only then, can we diversify away the user-specific risk? And if we can do this, then we can create a more scalable, more secure, more usable ecosystem for identity and for all of us. Thank you. Any questions? We've got a few minutes, I think. We've got about four. All right, I'll run. Four minutes, that's like another 75 slides. Yeah, so, so I hope the next 75 slides are going to be about the common risk because while, you know, we can talk a little bit about, uh, about risk versus information security exposure, I, I think the thing that's, that's missing here is that a lot of the events that have happened recently are common risk events, right? So big data breaches tend to reveal information which weakens authentication in more than one system. And that essentially uh, represents a common risk. So I'd, I'd like to hear more about uh, not just reducing specific risk, but also whether the mechanisms that we use to reduce specific risk can also keep us from building up these big repositories of common risk. Right, so anytime you have a big repository or a central node in the system, you're going to introduce some type of risk because essentially that becomes a very attractive target for one reason or another. Now to speak to your point specifically and how it applies to this example, if you have a vault of specific user credentials, while that could seem like a common risk, it's actually still idiosyncratic risk because as those identities now leak into the infrastructure, then each one of those is specific to an individual user, right? The common risk of the user would be more like an EMP going on off and nobody has access to do anything within any of their accounts. Well, well, so, but I mean, the EMP does go off, and in fact, the Matt Honan example, uh, you know, sh shows part of it. So I wasn't thinking so much of breaches of repositories of credentials as I was of breaches of repositories of personal information, which is used, you know, to establish accounts in the first place or to reestablish them. So social security information, uh, you know, home address information, as in the Honan case and what have you. Those, those sure. I think, are the common risk elements that, that happen in breaches. Yeah, no, uh, great point. Um, I would still say that if it is specific to a user, um, you're still dealing with some degree of idiosyncratic risk, uh, but I think that your point is, is very strong that we have to, as an industry, also do much better about how we're going to secure any of this proprietary personal data, right? Uh, especially, I mean, especially if it's, if it's super sensitive stuff, um, you know, um, social security numbers, uh, mother's maiden names, and what have you, which essentially are unlocking all the other things as well. Um, but yes, so I, I think, uh, not to go both ways on that, but I think that each one of those items is actually going to be a user-specific risk, uh, but the coordinating and keeping all of those items of data in one central spot is unadvisable. All right, thank you, Josh. Thank you, guys.